when you can see that. Hopefully that should be up for everyone now. Yeah, great. Um, so obviously today we're talking about costing and plicks. Um, so I'm Gavin Rush. I'm the costing and performance accountant at Chester. Um, just to give you a bit of background about myself and around our costing journey so far. Um, we I've worked at the trust for about 13 years and I spent the last six years leading on the costing program at Chester and um, before that I was in various different roles in the finance department. Um, for our cost and journey we were one of the first to implement a PLIC system back in 2007 and then in 2018 we moved to assist a PCG in line with the costing transformation program um, and we're, we've just had a new patient access system and our costing system has been bought out, so we're in the process of implementing another new costing system. So we're effectively, we're right back to the start of our costing journey again. Um, we're starting everything from scratch and building that up. Um, so I'll just pass over to Paula to introduce herself. Thanks, Gavin. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paula jones Kalkin. I'm the costing accountant at Mid Cheshire Hospitals, where I've been in post for about five months now. And um, prior to this, I worked in community costing since joining the NHS in 2016. Um, here at Mid Cheshire Hospitals, patient level costing, it's already quite well established um, and is being presented to our business um, users through Power BI dashboards. And um, we're currently developing our first national, as most trusts are, developing our first national community costing return. Um, so that's my primary focus right now, as well as obviously being new to acute costing. Um, I'm going through a period of learning. Um, despite me being new to acute costing, costing principles, why we cost and what the benefits are, they're universal across all sectors. Hence, I'm here today um, supporting Gavin with this. Um, so today's aim, so what are we going to cover? So we'll talk about what is costing and why it's uh, why it's important. Uh, we'll talk, we'll cover patient level costing, what we call PLICs, understanding a patient's journey and cost and how costing information can be used to improve patient care. Thanks, Paula. Um, so I'm going to do the first sec section and this is going to cover what costing is. Um, so uh, Textbook definition, um, costing is the way we work out how much the healthcare service we provide costs. So effectively, all the direct clinical time, all the estates, electricity, all the support services, finance, HR, how that gets to treating patients and how all those back office and all those direct costs. Um, sorry, is that better? Is anyone else having problems with sound? Just saw a comment then. So, uh, it seems fine from my perspective. If anybody else can't hear, can they put their hand up? I'm not sure. OK, so if, if anyone is having problems, try and um, just restart it, leaving and restarting. Um, I'm not sure what else to suggest if everyone else is able to hear, but I'll carry on. Um, and obviously we can share the video and any notes afterwards. If we've missed anything, we can catch up separately. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, I was like, yeah, the um, so the principle, so costing is based on three primary principles. So these are good quality source data. So that's primarily the patient record. So everything that's recorded clinically and um, patient coding, when the patient's been admitted, what wards they've been on, all that sort of thing. Um, then it's clearly identifiable costs. So this is on your budget statements that the right costs are on the right line so that we know what's it, what costs have been incurred where. Um, and that's important so that we can match those two up and then the matching up of those to the appropriate costing methodology. So how we know that one cost relates to a set of activity. So, for example, a cl a clinicians will sit on a clinical cost centre and we will use their job plans to work out how much of their time is outpatients, how much of that is spent in A&E, how much is in theatres, how much is terms on a ward. And it's having those up to date costing methodologies that allow us to split those costs appropriately to make sure that they're um, that they're getting back to the right patient activity. Um, costing then has three um, fundamental, well, three fundamental principles underpinned by um, transparency and consistency. So um, we'll just talk to you a little bit about these. So the first principle is around materiality, and this is focusing on high costs or high volume. So anything that's, so from a financial perspective, it would be 
um, 0.5% of expenditure and um, anything over 5% of a service cost, which what we would consider material um, and or anything that's high volume. So it might only be a small cost, but if you do a lot of that activity, it builds up. So um, pathology is probably a good example of that. It only costs a couple of pounds for a test in a lot of cases, but there's millions of them going through, so they quite soon add up to very large costs. So they would be material as together, but not necessarily an individual test. Um, and sometimes that creates difficulties when we're focusing on things that we have to go for the high, the high volume, high um, value in order to prioritise how we're costing and how we're working down our queries and where we're spending our time to focus on getting things right. Um, the next is engagement. This is probably the most important principle because it's only from talking to clinicians and for operational managers that we understand how the costs are actually incurred and how it's working. So we need to engage, we need people using the costing information and it needs to be 360 degree feedback. So we know the costing data isn't perfect, it will never be perfect, but it's getting it to a stage where it's good enough to make decisions and when it's good enough, it's getting that feedback to make it better. It will never be perfect, but that engagement is really, really important in getting it, it improving quality and so that it's reliable for decision making. Um, the next principle is around data and information. So again, this is all the patient level information that that's coming through. It's all the costs that you see on your ledger and it's making sure that information is relevant and accurate. Um, so it's an old IT adage, but garbage in, garbage out. If the data coming into the costing system is rubbish, the outputs are going to be rubbish and there's not really much you can do about it. So it's making sure that we have the best quality source data will give us better costing in the end ultimately. Um, and then underpinning all that is transparency and consistency. So you should, it should be transparent. You should be able to track through from your budget statement, from the activity you've done, where those costs and activity have gone in your costing system. And that allows people to have that full view and that full reconciliation. So that's really important. Um, it's also important that we're consistent. So when we're on, so the, our, that my costing methodology in the Countess of Chester is consistent with Paul as in Mid Cheshire because we'll compare those activity and we'll compare those costs to see if one of us is higher than the other and if so why. So it's having that comparative comparability between the two that really starts to drive value um, and as we go on to discuss later that will impact benchmarking and it impacts national cost collections and tariffs and ultimately it impacts government decision making that, that when they're using this data to draw assumptions in the treasury or in central government. OK, um, so now I'm just going to talk to you about a little bit about the different types of costs. So the first one, which is the biggest group of costs, will be direct costs. These are effectively anything that involves direct patient care. So any cost that is involved with delivering care directly to a patient would be a direct cost. We then have indirect costs. So this isn't something that's used very often in costing terms now, but it's sometimes used in financial management. So you might still hear it about. Um, and this is effectively any cost that is impacted by number of patients, but doesn't involve actually seeing the patient. So if you have 100 extra patients in, this cost will go up, but they don't actually directly treat the patient. So a good example of this would be clinical coding or health records where they're, they're their workloads based off patient volume, but they have no direct contact with the patients. Um, so a lot from a costing perspective, a lot of these costs would go into direct or overhead, depending where they sat. They're quite a small group. Um, and then the next, which is one we always get a lot of feedback on when we deliver things internally, is around overheads. So these are effectively anything that isn't impacted by patient volume and doesn't see a patient directly. So finance costs, HR costs, a lot of your estate costs, um, they are that they're all impact. They these are all overheads, and they won't necessarily go up if you see a lot. If you see more patients, or if you see less, they're impacted by different things. Um, so a good way that we use to an analyse these internally is often if, if you open brand new hospital day one with no patients, you would still have the costs for these services because you would still need HR for your staffing, you'd still need finance, you'd still need your estate costs. Um, 
so they're not directly impacted by the patient care itself, but they do support that. Um, so just a few examples of how overhead costs are allocated, because I'm conscious they're always a, a favourite talking point, especially when you have an initial meeting. Um, so a lot, the allocation methodologies are set by NHSI, so it's not individual costing accountants deciding what to do with them. We're told the best way to allocate overheads. So for example, finance would be billed based on uh, actual spend. So based on your cost centres, how much cost has gone in each patient facing cost centre, it will be allocated out and then eventually matched back to a patient that way. Um, and like, like, likewise, HR would be based on the headcount, so the number of staff employed, the, it would be allocated out to direct patient facing costs um, in that manner based on the number of um, staff on each cost centre. Um, However, from an NHSI perspective and from a national cost collection, we now have reciprocal allocation methodology. And effectively what that means, it's not just overheads are not just allocated against that direct patient facing costs that are allocated to other overheads. So finance have staff, so we get a share of the HR costs. HR have a budget, so they get a share of the finance costs. And these re reciprocal allocation methods continuously allocate that out until that spends at a patient level cost centre or at, at a patient level activity. Um, it can be very confusing and it's very complicated to work out. So sometimes when you come to look at your overheads from a costing perspective, it's not always clear where they come from. It's not as transparent as we would like it as costing accountants but it's thought to be a more accurate way of viewing overheads and it's the national guidance to produce them in this way. So I think, um, so I'm going to pass over to Paula now um, for the next section. section. Great, thank you, Gavin. So why is costing important? Um, so we can use costing information internally at, at a local level as well as externally by taking part in national programmes and costing submissions. So internal uses of costing can help us to um, develop sources of information that affect our local populations. Um, so service line reporting or um, PLICS on an internal level. Uh, we can gain an understanding of why and where costs, we call sometimes call these resources, where they are incurred. So what patient facing action is taken and where in that patient facing journey. Um, we can develop patient pathways, although this can be limited without that full information across sectors. We, um, we can use costing information um, for, for local matters, such as to inform uh, business cases, service reviews, cost improvement programmes and service level agreements. Um, external uses of costing. So um, to set prices, well, un until COVID, um, costing was used in the setting of prices and the national tariff. Um, so uh, costing can improve value added to external service users. Costing informs um, external and national benchmarking initiatives such as uh, the model hospital, the getting it right first time initiative, etc. Um, it supports external and national decision making, as we've said, and it gives assurance to the Department of Health um, and the public on, on what NHS spending is on, is made on. Um, benefits of costing then, so information is useless unless it's used. Um, so the true benefits of costing information are only understood when value is realised or where, when efficiencies are gained. So it's important that costing information is really used and it's, it's used to drive efficiencies and value um, for both patients and taxpayers. On a national scale, joined up costing information can inform where pathways require improvement. Um, again, this can be limited on a local level. Um, we have already said that costing informs benchmarking, so the benefit is, is then using that benchmarking at, on a wider sort of system level. Uh, limitations then, so there are some limitations um, uh, and they can be they can include the source data, like Gavin said, garbage in, garbage out. So if we picture costing as a simple input output 
you know, a process flow diagram, the biggest limitation is you only get out what you put in. Something as simple as a finance miscoding or um, a cost centre change of use um, that can really impact the quality of, of costing. Uh, another limitation is that costing absorbs all costs of the trust in which it operates. So a that, that final fully absorbed patient cost might not always represent how the patient facing service was delivered. Um, if we move on to the next slide, Gavin, please. So patient level costing then, so PLIX, is the practice of allocating costs to individual patients. Um, and in costing, we use these concepts of resources and activities to understand in, in sort of simple terms, who did what to whom. So the resources being the who did, um, so i.e. the components that are used to deliver, um, such as what, what staff was used or what equipment or what consumables were used. And then um, did what, so the activities being um, that, that measurable, measurable amount of work that was done to or performed upon the patient. So activities could be um, a procedure or a test or any kind of care contact, um, clinical facing time spent with the patient would be the activity. Um, so in, in terms of sort of how Plix have, has developed and, and where we are now. So traditionally we've, um, as costing practitioners, we've produced these reference costs which in simple terms are an average, an average cost of a service. So total cost of the service divided by total number of procedures or tests or whatever's happened gives you um, an average cost per activity um, from that service, not an average cost per patient, because as we know, patients can change. They have just different durations. They'll have a different number of tests and so on. So it's very averagey. <clears throat> So the cost and transformation program, um, which started around 2015, um, it had the program aim to to move away from this very average reference costs to a more detailed and consistent patient level um, cost collection. So um, the, the CTP has resulted in um, the national, a single national cost collection. Uh, which should, in theory, replace the uh, reference costs, although some areas um, they're still falling outside the scope of national cost collection for PLIX, so we're still submitting them on averages at the current time. But the majority of NHS services are now submitted at patient level detail through the NCC. Um, service line reporting then, so it's very much um, an internal and local method of um, presenting costs and sometimes income directly to service leads and managers. And the concept behind that is to provide that profitability information by individual service line rather than at the whole aggregated trust summary level and, and to provide it directly to the service managers who are potentially then closer to the, the, um, the resource use and the, the resource allocation decisions. Um, service line reporting is not mandatory, um, although it is widely used by many trusts um, on a local level. Um, and in principle, service line reporting can be built up using PLIX information, just, just aggregated up. Um, if we have the next slide, Gavin, please. Thank you. So what, what are the benefits of um, patient level costing and the national cost collection? So it, it's more accurate. Um, so what, why, why is it more accurate? So it reports that detailed and sometimes quite granular information about patient costs of care, including all the tests and procedures performed during a stay or a pathway. And that means that patient journeys can be costed in quite some detail across um, systems and sectors. Um, standard guidance reduces variation. Why? So, well, it, if all trusts are using the NCC standards, then, then all, we're all using the same approach. Um, so submissions are validated against a trust's audited accounts. Um, so as we all know, costs of NHS care it is public information. So, um, you know, it, it, it's introducing that PLEX can be audited and validated publicly. Um, and the, this greater focus on clinical engagement um, through the NCC. So in the production and reconciliation of um, NHS costing um, 
accounting information, it's got this greater focus on engagement. And as a result, where, where um, service line reporting provides a lot of local value uh, in transcribing that into a Plix output on a national level, it's providing that, that value on, on a more sort of national level. So benchmarking and decision making can take place at a higher level. Um, drawback, there are some drawbacks as there are with most things. Um, it, it can be complicated um, and, and timely to produce. So uh, patient level costing, you know, it is detailed and it needs to be consistent across all sectors and areas. So hence, it, you know, it can be complicated and it can take time to produce. And uh, the result, resulting outputs are published later. So. We, we tend to look backwards at Plix level information, even though it's being used for future decisions, it's often caveated information that we're providing. Um, NCC submissions are subject to sort of rigorous validations and checks, uh, as you would expect, but it, it just it further adds to the time taken to produce. Um, the outputs. So it, it effectively sort of smaller costing teams um, and, and sometimes, you know, smaller and more specialist trusts, they might have to just choose between um, that Plix technical development work and, and the real valuable engagement where you, you're getting the feedback from the clinicians and, and, and putting that through the system. You might just have to make a choice on, on, on where you use that resource. Um, and also sometimes those smaller trusts um, and the specialist services, they just don't fit into the NCC sort of format, the standards and the guidance. They, they, they're, you know, it's the 80-20 rule, isn't it? Some of those smaller ones, they, they'll take a lot of time, but they just don't fit into what we're looking at at the moment. Materiality considered, um, etc. I think that was it for me, Gavin. Yeah, thank you, Paula. OK. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about a uh, patient journey. So the example I'm going to use is a lady called Wynn. Um, she came in. So this is a, just to caveat it. It's a bit dated. These the data coming through. It's pre COVID um, and that's partly due to the effect COVID's had on costing. And obviously it's from Chester and we're, we're restarting that costing journey now. So we don't have anything more at stake at the moment. Um, but Wynne's story, she's a, she was a 97 year old lady living in sheltered housing. Then on the 4th of March, a few years ago, she had a fall and fractured her neck of femur. Um, she attended A&E, um, had surgical care and then went on to the ward. She was on a ward for 106 days before being discharged back to a nursing home. So when asked about her care, she thought she thought she'd had quite good care at Chester. She'd seen a lot of different people, couldn't remember everyone's names, but she thought the experience was quite good. Um, but then when we looked into a little bit deeper, it doesn't necessarily correlate to what we would consider good care. So and the costing information supports some of that delivery and highlights some of the areas that we want to improve patient care. Um, so to start with, with so the trust received um, £8,697 for delivering care to Wynn. So that was the national tariff plus whatever excess bed days we received for Wynn's care. However, the cost of Wynn's care was around £3,200, uh, sorry, £32,903. So significantly higher than the income we received. So a significantly loss making patient. Um, and when we looked at the elements to that, a big proportion is the ward day. So obviously she was on a ward for over three months. Um, well, it wasn't a ward and this is part of the issue that there were 10 wards, including 15 ward moves um, or bed moves. And not all of these were clinically driven. So there, she wasn't always being moved for a clinical reason, um, which uh, ultimately added to her length of stay ongoing. Um, so the £2,000 theatre costs, um, drug costs, so there's only £57 drug costs, but there were about 47 drug issues, so a lot of low level pain relief in general and I, I, ibuprofen, antibiotic, and antibiotics and paracetamol. Um, only a couple of pence each, but a lot of issues adding up to that. Um, Wynne had 11 x-rays during her time at Chester. She also had 147 pathology tests, uh, which was blood taken about 49 times and a total of 1.5 units of blood taken. 
um, but she was also given blood products. Uh, she had about five units of blood products given as well as part of her stay. Um, so that was a direct cost of around 27,000 with overheads that were about 20% added on top of that. So from that journey, we can see that Wynne was a very expensive patient and she had a lot of radiology, a lot of pathology and a lot of ward moves that wouldn't necessarily correlate to what we would consider good care. Um, so when we look at a bit more detail, what happened in Wynne's story when we start engaging? So that was the financial side in terms of where the costs were. So then we start engaging with clinical teams and looking at the reasons behind some of those costs. So Wynne had four inc incidents of hospital acquired pneumonia. She had uh, bed ulcers. Um, the ward 50, as we mentioned earlier, 15 ward moves or trans uh, location transfers. And she was under the care of five different consultants during that time. Um, so do, do we think this constituted as good care? Well, no, she was in hospital 85 days longer than what she should have been. So that was a significant cost and it was a pressure on obviously more pressure on wind to get. It was made that recovery after post hospital more difficult. Um, there was a lack of geriatrician input at the start of her stay, so that was more came at the end. And obviously, the longer she was in hospital, the more difficult that was to get her back out. Um, so five incidents of harm. So these are caused by sort of her being in a bed too long or requiring infections in the bed. Um, no single oversight of Wynne's journey. So there were diff five different consultants and not one person had oversight of her whole spell. Um, there were multiple moves, a lot of the, sometimes overnight, um, transferring it to different beds or different wards. So again, more likely to pick up new infections, being moved around quite a lot, uh, potentially spread infections to other areas of the hospital as well. So that again will have added to her, her length of stay. Um, and overall, we would consider that quite a poor patient experience that she's not really got the care she needed to get out of hospital and that rehab in time. Um, so how can costing help be, it sort of address some of these issues? So by reviews, re, reviewing high cost patients like Wim, uh, we can try and identify pathways that aren't working correctly or particularly high value pathways. Um, and it then comes to working with clinicians. It's that engagement to look at why cost, why pathways are expensive. Uh, there may be situations where we have a more expensive pathway, but there are better clinical outcomes as a result of it. and that's fine to a certain extent. What we're trying to focus on is the pathways that are expensive that shouldn't be as expensive, that we're, we're a bit of an outlier. Um, and that might be just one pathway in a specialty and just picking general things from that, what we can improve on, or it might be a general specialty that we need a bit more investigation into. Um, so we can look at it as we can look at it more generally by points of delivery, HRG or procedure level. So this is some of the, service line reporting Paula was looking at that we can look at particularly loss making specialty and see if we can identify why there may be reason things that we can do there may be things outside of our control and um, so an example we've had is our oral surgery and orthodontics department they operate a particularly new area in our outpatient facilities and it's quite a large area so their overhead costs are quite high compared to other specialties so that drives some of their loss making and there's not really anything we can do about that whereas stories like wins where it's the direct patient care element that's high we there's a lot more that we can sort of go at to try and improve that that um as a trust obviously not from a finance perspective um and obviously, if there's if you already have a patient example, if you work if you've been working with a patient or working through the costing team, should be able to track them through your costing system and tell you how much they were, uh, how much that patient cost and what income we got from them. And then we can look at so seeing if you've got an example of what you think is good practice, how we can roll that out to other similar patients, or an example of bad practice, how we can sort of address some of the issues you think you've identified there. Um, obviously, as Paula mentioned, we do work quite retroactively in costing. Um, so it, you know, that information might not always be ready today, tomorrow, but we will have it and it's just trying to work out the best ways to work with each other to progress that going forward and get the most out of that costing information. Bear in mind, it's not always, it's not going to start off as great information. There will be data quality issues in it and it won't always be the most timely information, but it's a starting point and we can improve it with, with clinical support and operational support. Um, 
so the next step so store uh, so our aim with story like wins is to overall improve the patient experience and reduce harm and by doing so we believe that we'll also reduce length of stay and we'll reduce cost so it's a win from a financial perspective as well as the patient experience and the patient outcome perspective so really that's what we want to use co costing to drive those financial wins that also coincide with patient outcomes and improving their experience um, so wins story was shared with clinical teams we come up with several initiatives to address some of the issues so around the policies around how often we bleed patients, around how often pa patients are sent for exams. Um, anecdotally, we hear around, you know, if it, sometimes some of the junior doctors don't really know what to do, so they'll send them for uh, an x-ray. That may be the case, that may not. It's just something we hear anecdotally and it's addressing those issues. So can we come up with a guideline of what to do prior to sending patients to x-ray or does that patient need an x-ray? Obviously, if they need an x-ray, if they need a pathology test, then that's what that patient should have. If there's, if it's not going to tell you anything new, if it's not going to improve their care, it's looking at alternatives and trying to build that into our clinical policies and practices. Obviously, in conjunction with our clinical teams, that would have you know, things like this would have to be clinically led. They couldn't be finance-led. Costing would just support it. What the underpinning principles. Um, and then sort of implement changes and monitor monitor those changes going forward. So as a result of Wind story, we did see a reduction in length of stay. We did see a reduction of uh, pathology tests and people being sent, sent for them. Um, so that we have monitored some good changes. I will be honest, since the impact of COVID, we've stopped monitoring them everything changed and it wasn't really our focus so we're getting to the point now that we're reinitiating those initiatives and we're going to start monitoring them and get a new baseline of what post covid looks like to work out where we want to be in the future and what realistically that looks like we all know that the pre-covid environments are not the same as it is now so how do we build those changes in to sort of bring carry forward the learning that we've got from win or into this new world and into this new clinical environment. Um, so that's it from me and Paula. So if uh, anyone's got any questions, let's like pass. Um, we'll we need to take them now. Eric, do you want to go? I'm assuming it was the same question that you put in the chat, but if you want that's to That's right. Um, so I have a particular reason for asking this, which is that our trust has, has entered a joint venture with respect to pathology and everything is now commercial in confidence so that we don't know how well we're doing. So I just wondered, um, what's the official position? Do trusts need to benchmark their services or is this an option? Um, so I suppose the mo at the highest level, it would be the National Cost Collection. So those results are published and you get something called the National Cost Collection Index, which rates your trust. So if you're one, you are exactly on average, you're, you're middle of the road national average. If you're below one, then you're cheaper than average. If you're above one, you're higher than average. Um, Is that, so does that work per service, for example, pathology? There are different, so it's done as the trust as a whole, and I believe it's our service line. And Paula, is that, they do do it split by point of delivery, don't they? Um, yeah, I, I, I understand it's all available on an average level. Sorry, there's quite an echo, isn't there? That's better. Um, so, yeah, my understanding is if you um, if you look up national cost collection, uh, it's all available as public information. It will be on an average level. You can't find specific patient detail, but uh, I should think you'd be able to find pathology costs for your trust. Um, it might be a couple of years out of date. As I say, it's, it's quite often, <laughs> but yeah, it, it should be out there, Eric. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. There's also the model hospital includes a lot of it. I'm conscious the national cost collection probably looks at just your direct access pathology. Yeah. But they they told me that because it's commercial in confidence, it's not in model hospital. OK, um, I'm, I'm not sure because <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go back to them with the NCC. Yeah, it, it will be submitted as part of that and that is nationally benchmarked. Um, so there should be some information there available um, for benchmarking. It might not be everything, but you should have something. 
Perfect, thank you. There's a couple more in the chat. So one from Juliet around what is the ballpark figure for basic daily laws? Hello. Can you see this, Gavin? <laughs> I'm not technically competent enough to do this. Uh, what is the ballpark figure for basic daily length of stay? Um, so I, does this, I, I'm, going, I'm going to take a guess that this is around a bed day cost. So if that's the case, in Chester, pre-COVID, we would have said that bed day cost is around £250, fully absorbed. Um, that is consultant cost, your nursing cost and any overheads. Um, a direct cost in terms of ward care is probably around £150, um, give or take. So that is your just your nursing element to that. You, you, so your nursing and ward costs of that 250 are about 150 pound then you've got an extra 100 which is your overheads and your consultant charges that's what we would use in chester um paul i'm not sure if you've got anything similar in mid or if i did something recently with um cost per ward day cost per bed day and i think we got about 250 on average uh, i mean it varies massively so so on average i'd say 250 yeah and that's sort of in line with national tariff as well with income and excess bed day is usually between 220 and 250 pounds so that's ballpark would be my guess but obviously it would vary between trust and between service Perfect. just looking at um wind's example on your example gavin so if we say accommodation was the 23 nearly 24,000 over 106 days so it's about 225 pounds in, in that example which was a couple of years old wasn't it yeah yeah. <laughs> There's just another one in the chat then about the example with Wynne as well and asking when did her discharge planning start and who was involved if it was a real example? Yeah, I thought about it in the chat. Um, that's a very good question and I don't know the answer, unfortunately. Um, it was a real example. It re Wynne is a real patient. Um, I don't know the details of that though, I'm afraid. Um, I can't think. I'd have to sort of go back through the notes and start looking at that. I'll make sure to see it. No um, does oh, okay. anybody else have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Oh. Abby, do you want to go? Yeah, if I can work. I think my video is not working. Sorry, I currently work for Mid and South Essex. Can you hear me? Sorry, folks. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Fab. So really interested in this because um, previously, and I'm a divisional general manager, so really use a lot of um, SLR in terms of trying to triangulate um, with model hospital and GERFT and trying to sort of drive home efficiencies. How well is SLR used in your hospitals from your ops colleagues? And do you think it's recognised as a powerful tool? Because I do find it quite useful. And especially for sites, I'm not sure, Gavin and um, Paula, if your sites are, if you've got multi-site, where you get a lot of variations in, in costs for services, for instance, that are delivered across different sites. Um, so I'll go first, and then I'll pass over to Paula. Um, so Chester is two sites, but our second site is Ellesmere Port Hospital, which is a lot smaller, and that's generally used for rehab care. So it's a very different type of care than what's delivered at Chester. So it it is separate it is very different but the care isn't really it's not similar to anything we would deliver at Chester it's quite different it's the re rehabilitation usually there um so in terms of how well SLR is used um we tend to use it more at a strategic level so more at board and service review level than needing to be sort of integrated with the service line managers and getting engagement there um we're conscious that's probably not the right approach and that's not where we want to be going forward. Um, following the impl implementation of um, the costing transformation programme and the national cost collection and a brand new costing system a few years ago, we were in the position in around 2020 when we were ready to start ramping up our quarterly reporting again and start producing new benchmarking tools and new um, dashboard probably I think we we're going to use Power BI or ClickView and then we could really start that engagement piece and get a clinical costing group set up to try and push this forward obviously in March 2020 Covid hit and everyone went everything like costing basically went on the back burner for 12 months that it wasn't a priority for anyone 
then this year we've had a new PAS system. So again, that's the big priority for everyone. So we don't currently use it as well as we should. We have had more detail in the past and that was the aim to get back to that. But as I mentioned at the start, we're right back at the very start of our costing journey again. So it's going to take us a while to get back up to that level where we're confident enough in the data that we can go out and really start engaging and driving value with it. Um, I'll defer now to Paula because Paula is probably in a much better condition regarding the costing. <laughs> Hi, Dawn. Oh, sorry, Eric, you need to go on mute. <laughs> That's better. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I'm quite new at Mid Cheshire Trust. So we just have one main hospital here. And um, my understanding is prior to COVID that patient level costing was quite well established and it was used um, out by the divisions, by the services. Um, so we've got these dashboards and it, it, it was quite well used. Um, but I have come from um, previously from a, a community um, costing sector where we did have many locations um, but what's quite different with community costing is you don't get those um, add-ons so what what is patient facing is patient facing there's no add-ons of a journey so there's no add-ons of um, you know x-rays or any kind of tests or anything it so what what happens in the community is what happens so if we were thinking about wind's journey for instance um, so where Wynne came out of the hospital and then was presumably released into the community, she may have needed some community care. What would be really useful from a costing perspective is then to join up that community costing information with Gavin's information on Wynne to really understand where we could have um, made changes to that journey um, that would have been cost effective and improved um, Wynne's journey. Um, altogether, so I'm sorry I've, I've digressed there. Did that answer your question? <laughs> A little, yeah, and, and I think I suppose going back to yourself and Gavin, where I suppose what I should have said is with the two different sites or where you've got a multi-site, are they offering the same service, i.e. dermatology or respiratory or something, and if those costs would be the same when you look at SLR and if there's any variation in that, um, do they use your services to try and sort of, um, I suppose, close that gap? Um, I guess if, it, it, if we had, say, a dermatology service, um, it it might um if it was delivered from from one site versus another um the costs would be quite similar um and and yes we would present those costs to the service leads and we'd have discussions with them um on, on site but I, I think to fully answer your question i think the real value would be in submitting those costs on a national level so that they can be looked at for for a whole system yeah. rather than yeah yeah <laughs> I'd just add to that, it's probably going back to what we said around the data coming into the system. I know from the data mm -hmm. feeds we get in Chester, there probably wouldn't be, if we had a second site or if we did run clinic, more, more stuff out of Elsmere Report, there probably wouldn't be a huge difference in cost because the consultant ward care costs would just be split across their activity in Chester yeah. and their activity in Elsmere Report. We wouldn't know how much of their time was spent in one than the other yeah yeah um, so the real value would be having a job plan that discerned yeah absolutely if we had that then because obviously the site cost would be different we'd be able to tell them um so we'd need sort of the consultant job plans and any other direct yep. costs yep. that go in split between sites and then you could build up a well you know your clinics are twice as expensive at this site than they are at this why is that oh it's because you run half as many clinics in one site compared to the yeah. other why why do you run on that way and i suppose it's similar to the national stuff that uh, but probably at a smaller level but it's having that source data to make those costing allocations i know we don't have anywhere near the, enough detail in chester to start going down to that sort of granular level and um, fortunately we, we only have the one main site predominantly um so it's not as it's not really bit as big of an issue for us uh, thank you both Thank you. There's one more comment or question from Juliet in the chat, which Gavin, I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer this one because it's another question related to the example about whether the trust infection rate was higher than average or if Wynne was just unlucky. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know what the trust infection rate was at the time. Um, I know we did see a reduction in, um, uh, well, we saw a reduction in bed days and obviously it went through our infection control team to address some of these issues. Um, I'm not sure on what the metrics were to start and end with. Um, I'd have to go back and dig them out. 
Okay, great. Any more for any more? If not, then thank you both very much for your time.